Welcome to the Common Meal Policy Podcast with me, Jonathan Shaffey. I'm the Campaigns Officer here at Common Meal, and I'm delighted to be joined as ever by Dr Craig DL, who's the Head of Policy and Research at the Think Tank. Uh, Craig, welcome to the show. Hello, how are you doing? Hi, not bad. I think things seem to be getting a little bit better in terms of the weather uh, and also in terms of the uh, apparent trajectory uh, that we're on in relation to lockdown. Uh, in fact, I was going to ask you about this before we get into the uh, today's topic, um, which I know is a very popular one um, around the question of land reform. Uh, but as we have been doing on these on these discussions that we have in the podcast, I um, wondered if you would give listeners just a, a little bit of an appraisal of where you think things are when it comes to the, the question of lockdown and, and pandemic and so on. Well, this is the thing, because we are now um, you know, a year into the, the pandemic really affecting Scotland. Um, it was a year ago last week that uh, we all left the, the Commonwealth office for the, for many of us for the last time. I, I haven't been back and for, uh, other uh, others on the team have, have only been back in sporadically to, to deal with things like the the, the shop um so that that's been the the, the big change of, of of the last year um there i mean things have been looking slightly better although i say that with a note of caution the, the vaccine rollout is continuing it, it seems to be going fast a little faster than than i thought it would uh, several months ago uh, when it was when when the plan was first rolled out although we are also seeing potential issues with vaccine supplies that might make it a bit of a, a rocky road to come uh, i do have a little bit of an anecdote that in mm. the, the last week there there was someone in my village who uh, was was given an invitation to go and get their vaccine, but they they weren't sent to our local vaccination centre in the next village over. They were actually sent to um, one of the ma- one of the main hubs a, a fair distance away, and this person didn't have a car, and it was going to be very difficult, possibly even impossible, to get there via public transport um, at, at that time on a, a Saturday evening. So. They put out a call and and we stepped in, gave them a ride up. And I have to say, I was very impressed with the the number of people, just the constant flow of people going in and coming out, which gives me some some hope for the efficiency of the whole process. But it's still a little note of concern there that there might still be some issues with some people just getting to the the clinics to get their jags. And this is certainly something that we flagged up when there was talk of moving to like a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week um process for vaccinations which is all very well if a you can drive to to get to a vaccination center at three in the morning but also b if you're able to leave your house at three in the morning not everybody not everybody is so this is one of the things that really needs to be constantly thought about as we're going through this process of getting everyone vaccinated is what is a, a, a trivial journey for one person might be difficult or even impossible for someone else yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I think it's all uh, still a little bit uncertain. Uh, although people do seem to become more confident around it. I mean, the one thing that I get sort of slightly, uh, I suppose, mixed feelings about is uh, you know, one week you're you're reading or, or listening to Chris Whitty, who's of course the the UK government's chief scientific advisor, and he's saying that there could well be a surge in the virus uh, upon uh, opening up a few months after, towards late summer, um, or even into to going into the winter. Um, and that's because the, the virus is able to find people who are not vaccinated or, or a section of the population who are vaccinated. And so, obviously, the, the idea that the vaccine is a magic wand has been contested by some. Um, so, I think we still got a way to go. Um, and... Uh, uh, we need to ensure that this this really is the the last of the the lockdowns in my view anyway because uh, going back and forth to lockdowns is is probably uh, about the worst situation you can imagine not just socially and economically but but psychologically as well I would I would argue yeah absolutely um, I mean the, the for for all the people who have been affected directly by this virus the 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 actual percentage of people in the country who have been infected. Uh, it isn't anywhere near you know uh, the the hundred percent or herd immunity stage, so we are relying on this vaccine to protect everyone, and we also need to remember that you know until everybody is protected, you know everybody has to do their part to protect those who aren't yet vaccinated, and or 
you know, can't be vaccinated. There are people out there who are maybe vulnerable to this virus, but for some reason may also not, it may also not be possible for them to have the vaccine due to, you know, an allergy or whatever, or some other medical condition that prevents them from having it. This is why, you know, we have to protect everybody uh, and achieve that herd immunity through vaccines to, to, to protect those that can't get it directly. Um, my big worry is there will be a political pressure to open up very quickly once the death rate starts falling, once, once older people who are more vulnerable to, to actually dying from this virus are protected. All those who are less likely to die, you know, you know might want to open up, end the lockdown, get back to normal. But, you know, we still have that mass transmission. We still have people getting, you know, the, the, the very extended symptoms that are being sort of collected under that long COVID moniker. Um, plus all the people who are vulnerable and can't be vaccinated are now exposed. So we still, yes, have to tread very carefully. We have to, um, keep the transmission rate down as much as possible. And I'm really glad to see that the Scottish Government is again talking about a, a zero COVID strategy, saying there's no acceptable level of transmission in Scotland and we should aim for zero. Um, that was the talk um, between the last two uh, waves, but we didn't quite get there. And when we opened up, especially a year ago after the after the first wave, as soon as we opened up again, we saw that exponential rise in infections you know, within days of opening up. So we do need to keep a, a lid on this. We do need to not just say we want to aim for zero COVID. We need to actually aim for it and actually take the actions we need to do to get there. Well, it's uh, all very interesting. In fact, maybe we should do a, a podcast um, at some point on the, the whole notion of zero COVID because I I know there's some there's some discussion and debate about that as well, and be quite interested to to go into that into a bit more detail. Um, but for now, let's turn to the to the main subject matter of of this week's podcast, which um, is a long running uh, issue and one that we know is uh, of high importance to lots of people in the independence movement and beyond, uh, and that is the question of land reform. Um, and there's been a number of reports uh, that Commonweal and others have been working on. Uh, one of these reports, which has, is a, a collaborative effort, um, which was launched yesterday. Um, you can find coverage of it in today's National. Um, and uh, also uh, a, a report at the top of the week, um, which focused on how land reform could uh, could develop a whole range of, of new jobs uh, and employment. So we're going to go through these. Um, there is more, uh, would you believe, um, on top of these reports, uh, which is to come out in due course. Um, but just by way of, of a brief introduction, uh, Craig, I wonder if you could maybe just for the listeners give a, a, an impression of the journey, I suppose, since, uh, say, 2014, because obviously the issue goes well before that. But since the referendum, there has been this kind of journey around land reform, hasn't there? And there's been some disappointments along the way that we're, we're hoping to, to rectify, I guess. Oh, I mean, this this isn't just a, a few years people have been campaigning on this. This has been decades. This, is, this has been a thing that has has impacted the entire devolution era of Scotland. Uh, folk like Andy Whiteman were writing about this with, with in, the, in the, the very early years of that devolution period. But it's also an issue that goes back literally centuries. Yeah. This is something that is so deeply embedded in the, the history and the, the, the shape of Scotland all the way back to the, the, the Highland Clearances and beyond. Uh, this, this, and it's such a fundamental issue that it's, it, it is surprising that, that so little has been done. And it, it is surprising when you still talk to people who, who say that this is, this is something that we can wait until after independence to do. Once we, once we're independent, then we can think about this kind of thing. A lot of the stuff that we are, we are talking about in this series of papers in our land reform week, almost all of it is th is covered within the devolution settlement almost all of it the scottish parliament could do now uh, and we'll talk a wee bit about the, the the very few things that it can't really do but it, it this could be the the biggest thing that scotland does this side of independence we don't need to wait till after it and that's the that's the, the message i really want to get across to folk and if we do you know, grasp this challenge and do go for it and we start to show what Scotland can do, 
uh, in, in terms of radical change, then maybe that can help build our confidence to take that next step and get to independence. Yeah, and I suppose, uh, you know, that, that long uh, history uh, that you talk about, I suppose that uh, the reason I'm mentioning the, the years from 2014 is that there was this kind of real hope that the Scottish government would do something quite serious uh, around land reform, which which really hasn't um, hasn't come to, to all that much. So the work that, that Commonwealth and others uh, have done uh, on these reports, I suppose, is, is a, a prospectus for, for how uh, a radical approach could be taken and how it could be taken forward in the next parliament as well. So so let's turn to the first of these reports. We'll link to both of them uh, in the, the, uh, uh, below, the, below the podcast. The first of them, Work the Land, the Employment Potential of Land Reform. Uh, and this looks at how... Uh, the the reform of how we utilise land over land ownership and so on uh, could uh, create a huge number of jobs uh, and and well well paid uh, jobs at that as well uh, in in Scotland. Um, do you want to take us through a, a kind of outline of the of the key points? Yeah, I like to think of this paper work the land as the the why of land reform is what what is it we're trying to achieve by this land reform um, and. Uh, also to address some of the challenges that, that come at land reform advocates from folk on the other side who want to maintain the status quo of the, the big landed hunting estates and, uh, and, and that, that landscape of Scotland, um, which is iconic, but iconic for a lot of the, the wrong reasons. Um, the, the argument that is levied against land reform campaigners is that uh, things like the, the, the Grouse Moor estates are keystone employers to the rural economy and and that if you disrupted that industry um then you know you'd put a lot of people out of work and you would devastate local uh, rural communities and and their employment opportunities what we're saying is uh, building on our previous work in um on on land reform is that doing almost anything else with that land would create more jobs, would create better paid jobs, would create more secure employment and ultimately be a lot better for these rural economies than what we have right now. So when it comes to some of the the kind of uh, outcomes, I suppose, uh, from taking this kind of approach, what kinds of of, of jobs uh, do you think that we're looking at here are not just what types of jobs, but you know how how do you see this kind of creating the kind of potential uh, that there is, which in terms of the numbers of jobs, I was quite struck, uh, is apparently in the tens of thousands. So, mm. what, what kind of things are we sort of talking about here? So, some of these jobs are already exist in Scotland, but but it's uh, it's in sectors that could be expanded and improved. So, a good example of this is in commercial forestry. Um, we need to do that better. I'm not advocating that we expand those plantations of, of, of spruce that you see everywhere and, and, and you know, that are, are far too densely planted, um, really leave nothing of an ecology within them. And when they're ready for harvesting, they're just clear cut and, and really cause a lot of damage to the landscape in, that, in themselves. That's the wrong kind of commercial forestry. We should be looking at much more sustainable ways of doing that. Um, but Scotland really should have far more trees than it has now. We, we have a, a target of, of 50% of Scotland becoming forested, and a, a portion of that should be commercial forest. So we can see a, a large expansion of that 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 commercial sector, which also then goes into a, an expansion of the, the further supply chain. So processing of that wood into uh, timber for construction or for, um, p- perhaps into more advanced timber products like um, cross-laminated timber, uh, which can can produce really strong, really impressive structures, even to the point of you know, uh, skyscraper-sized buildings made almost entirely out of wood called ply scrapers um, and some of the emerging technology in that is, is really impressive. But on a more humble scale, we need more housing in Scotland. And we've got written papers about that. We've talked about that in the podcast in many an episode. Those houses need to be built to Green New Deal standards. And that means not just better energy efficiency and insulation involved in them, um, but more sustainable materials used to construct them. So that's more demand for wood. 
rural economies especially need this, uh, need more housing. So you can see how producing these forestry jobs and supply chain jobs, then producing local housing, you can really bootstrap the economy of, of some of these rural areas. Yeah, um, I mean, it's... Sorry, you were saying. Continue. Yeah, so so that's a, that's one of the examples of, of expanding an existing sector. Another one that could be expanded is better better farming. Now, a lot of the crofting that happens in Scotland, a lot of the very small scale farming that happens in Scotland, it was never really designed to be anything more than subsistence farming or a subsidiary income. Uh, your average crofter in Scotland earns two thousand pounds a year from crofting. This isn't a full time uh, salary position um but you can think of it as, as 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 being a supplement to to income you can also think about how we could improve that that crofting income so land reform could give access to better land land for crofters could access more land which allows you know more farming income but we can also think about how we change the shape of farming going into the green new deal one of the things that's that's often brought up is the need to to eat less meat in a Green New Deal world. Um, one of the consequences of that might be an impact to, to rural farmers in Scotland who are sheep farmers or, or um, have, have cattle. Now, we're not saying we have to get rid of all of that, but we might have to shrink some of those herds. How do you do that while maintaining income? Well, you can start thinking about hardier breeds, um, premium breeds, sort of very hyper local breeds. So, you know, your local area having its own very, uh, very hyper local specific breed of sheep that can, can then attract an income, a premium on the market. Um, so that's, that's something we talk about in the paper is improved farming, but, Going from those sectors that are, you know, already in Scotland, but how could, how do we improve them? We can also now think about some of the new sectors that Scotland needs. And this is where the, a lot of the, these jobs come in. So some of them are in industry and engineering, uh, energy engineering, especially renewable energy. We talk about um, expanding uh, wind power, but we also need to expand things like solar solar power in Scotland. In our Green New Deal plan and the Common Home plan, that I'll link to in the in the podcast, we call for a massive expansion of using solar thermal panels to generate a substantial portion of Scotland's heat for housing. So that needs a lot of engineering to, just to get these, these solar panels installed. And you can imagine areas of land in Scotland are suitable for generating that, that, that energy, but also maybe storing that energy. A lot of these areas in, could be in rural, in rural Scotland and could benefit from land reform to get access um, to develop those those energy resources. But we also have to talk about rewilding, you know, bringing Scotland back to nature. That iconic image of the, the, the Highland Hills with the heather is a very managed landscape. It's not wilderness. It's deliberately managed to produce more grouse for shooting. Uh, a lot of Scotland shouldn't be that kind of heather, heather hillside. It should be more like a, te a, 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 a temperate rainforest. So, yeah, so if we want to start rewilding Scotland and bringing back those wild forests, we can't just, you know, abandon the land and expect it to come back itself. Some of it might, but what we really should be doing is thinking about fairly intensive land management to, well, to intensively plant those forests, to reintroduce animals, um, to, to, the, um, to, to live in those forests, including potentially predators. Uh, so we could be talking about reintroducing wolves and lynx to Scotland. Those managed uh, forests will need park rangers and wildlife managers to to make sure everything everything mm. is is working okay. We also then can use that to develop ecotourism in Scotland for people to come in and 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 shoot those predators with cameras rather than guns. Well, certainly a better way of of shooting. We can uh, hopefully I'll agree on that. <laughs> uh, but the the picture you paint of of these wild forests and uh, ply scrapers, I have to say, is um, uh, it's quite appealing to me. Um, I think it sounds like the kind of future we want to be building. And it's it's interesting when you talk about all those um, those opportunities, um, including economic opportunities. Um, uh, that one of the key arguments that's put forward by I suppose the status quo, if you want to put it like that. Is that the kind of land reform we're advocating would would harm um, uh, these kinds of economies and, and far from it? So, so this paper is very important strategically 
for for making the argument um i would argue and so and so that's uh, important and, and people should read it through um and they should share it and and, and campaign on it uh, lobby your your msps and so on in, in the new parliament um, just move on to the second paper then, and this has been done uh, in conjunction with a, a range of, of organisations. Um, I should say the, the, the first paper we discussed there was uh, in partnership and, and done uh, for Revive, uh, which is the, the Coalition for, for Grouse Moor Reform. Uh, this paper we did in alliance with the New Economics Foundation, and it's entitled Our Land, A Vision for Land Reform in Scotland and How We Get There. Um, again, that'll be linked uh, below the podcast. It's good to work uh, with other organisations, isn't it, Craig? And, and to be working to to support campaign organisations with policy proposals, campaign organisations like uh, Revive, uh, for example, we've got a very good um, relationship with. Now, um, to take us through this, uh, if you can, Craig, and just give us the, the kind of broad, um, I suppose, the broad overview of, of what the key points in this paper are and, and why you think they're important. Yeah, so if the previous paper was the why of land reform, this is really the how. This is going into all the policy levers that Scotland would need to pull in order to to make land reform happen. And as I say, the vast majority of them are already within the powers of the Parliament. Um, So we're talking about completing the land register. This was a manifesto promise um, from the SNP in 2016. um, And it's, it's... to, to the the register of who owned each patch of land in Scotland was uh, was very incomplete. Um, some of the records were, even if they existed, a lot of them were centuries old and, and existed on paper only. So the process of gathering them all, digitizing them, getting them into a unified database, and putting them actually on a map, you you can now. Uh, pull up a map of Scotland, zoom in, and click on any part of Scotland, and if it's if uh, the data has been entered into the register, it will tell you who owns that particular patch of Scotland. Um, but the the, the register is not complete, um, and and the the timeline to to complete it has has been delayed, not least because of the the, the COVID pandemic. Um, so we need to complete that. And one of the calls that this paper also says is that we should make inclusion in that register contingent on getting tax breaks and subsidies. So right now, um, for a lot of the estates that, that haven't yet registered, that, that process is still voluntary. It's not, it's not going to become compulsory for another couple of years. But if you said to folks, right, if you're not on the register, you can't get any more subsidies for the land that you own, then that might speed the process up a bit. Uh, we are also calling for s- some some review on on land taxes. Yeah. Now this is something that we talked about very recently with regards to a replacement for council tax. That's right. Uh, we are yeah. calling for a property tax that would cover both land and buildings. So extending that property to tax to land would would help to reform that ownership because it would frankly make some of the larger estates simply unaffordable for a single person to own. We are going even further than that. Um, We're calling for a cap on the amount of land that an individual can own. Um, And there are various ways that we can we can address this problem. The, the, The paper talks about the need for reforming inheritance so that if someone already owns land above the the whatever the cap is set at then we're not don't necessarily strip it from them immediately but then when they die and the estate is inherited whoever inherits it can only inherit a cap's worth of land now the downside of that plan is one inheritance uh, tax isn't within the scottish parliament's powers it's one of those reserved areas Two, the climate emergency is rather more urgent than this. We don't have time to wait for generations for um, for that method of land reform to, to take action. If we'd been talking about this a century ago, then maybe. But we probably need to be a bit more proactive than, than that. So, which is why the paper then talks about calling for compulsory sales orders and compulsory purchase orders um, to... to, if, uh, to, to hurry the process along and break up the estates more proactively. Uh, We're also talking in the paper about a land agency. Now this is again something that Scotland could set up. We have seen too many stories recently of uh, landowners 
ignoring or skirting the edges of environmental regulations to do with the land. There was a case um, quite recently, not that far from from where I am, of a of neurotoxins being found on privately owned land, um, which is utterly illegal. Um, and we've also seen so many cases of, of birds of prey being persecuted and shot and trapped on on private land, but very few prosecutions come out from uh, from these. Partly because uh, it's, it's it's been so difficult to to prove liability. So we need a land agency to strengthen the regulations and the laws around how land is managed, and then to ensure compliance with them. Uh, then finally, in the paper, we're talking about democratizing planning and uh, land use. So. Another thing that we've talked about is that Scotland has some of the worst levels of local democracy in Europe. We don't have effective local democracy in Scotland. So we need to, ha to, to have that municipal scale democracy so that, that communities can decide what is happening on the land around them. And if um, we can maybe combine that with things like citizens' assemblies made up of, of local residents to start to determine how that land is used for the benefit of the entire community. Well, that's a, a, a really excellent um, overview that you've provided there, Craig. And, and just when you're talking about it, it's, I know I say this quite a lot, but I think it is a point just constantly worth reinforcing um, because it's about how these policies interlock. Uh, and if you look through uh, lots of the, the issues that have been raised in the in the discussion over this in the, the last paper um, on land reform, you can see the overlap. You know, when you can see the overlap to our... Um, policy that we've done on, on land value taxes, for example, or the uh, or how, for example, we've approached the question of, of citizens' assemblies. And you start to see how all of this stuff starts to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, the housing paper that you talked about in relation to the, uh, to the work the land uh, policy proposal, for example, how that would work together. Uh, how it all connects into this idea of building and, uh, and transforming the economy so that it, it works for both people and planet. To me, that's the most inspiring thing, that these aren't just standalone policies that in and of their own right are, are worthy and, and, and should be taken forward. But can you imagine a Scotland in which we actually put forward and implemented all of the policies that uh, exist in the policy library? No, uh, no uh, small, uh, in no small uh, way uh, a result of Craig and, and other people's work. Um, can you imagine uh, how that would look if we if we were to implement all of those all of those ideas? But really, that's the kind of thing we've got to do, isn't it, Craig? Because yeah. as you point out, this is linked to the question of climate change. It's linked to the question of uh, how you address an economic collapse uh, and all that kind of thing. So there is an urgency here, isn't there? So what would you say to uh, to people who are listening about how they can kind of take this forward? I mean, are you wanting people to to raise this within the independence movement within their Political party branches, or trade unions, or, or even with politicians. Yeah, I mean it's not just not just an urgent problem; it's an extremely acute one. As I say, that Scotland's yeah. land is intent is is the land ownership patterns are incredibly centralised around just a few people. Many folk will know the statistic that four hundred and thirty-two families own half of Scotland's private land. Half, you know, half of Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> um, not not so many will know that 750,000 acres of Scotland is owned by companies based in tax havens. And there was a report just today saying that about £5 billion worth of, of private investor money is, is eyeing up Scotland's estates to try and clamour in and buy it so that the, the, the investment folk behind that can claim green credentials. And the quote in the article, which I'll link to, um, said that Scotland is one of the few areas in the world where uh, green resources can be bought up in it on any kind of scale. <laughs> that should be sending alarm bells to anyone who thinks that this man, this 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 our land should be, uh, should be managed for the people who live here. Yeah, and uh, I think that's a, a good way to to bring this to a conclusion because you know we've underlined the urgency, the acuteness uh, to to borrow your word of the issues and also of the positivity that we we can generate around. We do actually have the ideas. We do actually have the solutions. Um, and uh, we do have, um, despite all of this work um, on these two reports, we do actually have more coming out. Um, and I know you can't give away 
uh, too much detail on that, um, Craig, but maybe just give our listeners just a bit of a, a teaser of, of, of what's coming up. Yeah, so this Sunday we're going to be closing out the land reform week with a with a, a final paper. If the the first two were the the why and the how of land reform, this one is going to be the the what will Scotland look like after we have reformed that land. It's going to give us a good illustration of of exactly what these rural economies could look like. Uh, these rural communities could look like um, once we have made all of these changes to the policies to get the land reform going and, and we've managed to get all these new industries and, and uh, jobs into those areas. Yeah, very good, um, as always, uh, to talk uh, to you, uh, Craig, about the, the issues which are pressing. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having more discussions. Uh, as we always say, though, we want to get your uh, views as well. So if you get any further questions that you'd like answered uh, on any of the land reform uh, policy papers, then, then get in touch. Um, but equally, if you have any ideas or, or suggestions um, that you would like to see covered in terms of the discussions that we have in these podcasts, uh, then then do get in touch as well. Oh, and it does remind me actually, uh, Craig, that you were you were doing some stats, weren't you? And it might be just good to to leave the listeners with uh, with uh, some some idea of the the statistics around this podcast, which are to me they were quite. Uh, quite interesting. Yeah, so I was diving into the analytics for this podcast because I'm a weird stats geek and I love my spreadsheets. Um, this week, the podcast is likely to hear from its 35,000th listener, which is a good wee milestone to hit. Uh, we've also been um, spreading our audience across the world. Uh, we've, we've recently picked up a, a subscriber from uh, South Africa. So wh whoever you are, uh, wherever you are, and however you're listening, please get in touch and, and let us know how you found the show and what you think of it. Which is fantastic. I mean, 35,000 uh, listens, uh, and I believe these are, uh, relatively speaking, unique listens so there'll be some overlap but thirty five thousand or so uh, is is really brilliant um and i have to say i mean it was it was actually higher than than i had uh, than i thought uh, but uh, it does show that there is a huge interest in uh, not just uh, lots of people wanting to to hear craig and i have a chat for half an hour uh, but but seriously there's a lot of interest in the policy work um, and a lot of engagement with it so we want to to nurture that and to continue that and to and to grow uh, that potential as we move forward. So do give us your feedback and let us know um, what you would like us to, to discuss. Uh, with that, we'll be back next week. Um, stay safe, everyone. And uh, yeah, look out for the, the third of these reports on land reform coming out on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs>